Good morning. The book of Acts reports that when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all gathered in one place. And suddenly, from heaven, there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. This story is recognized worldwide as the birthing moment of the universal Christian church. And the winds of that same spirit continue to blow among us still today. So whether you're sitting in the pews or joining us virtually, you are welcome in this sacred place. On this Pentecost Sunday, we hope that you may feel and know the presence of the one true God and trust that God is still speaking. And what better way to begin our worship than with a celebratory ringing of the bells of praise? So at this point, we hope you have enjoyed this brief time before worship to visit with your neighbors. But now we want to invite you to use the next few minutes during the musical prelude, prelude to prepare your minds and hearts and to quiet your voices for worship. Thank you, Bells. If you would, please stand in body or in spirit and join me in the call to worship. When the day of Pentecost had come, the disciples were all together in one place. Today, followers of Christ gather in many places. God's Spirit still blows like a mighty wind. 
breathing new life into the bodies, hearts, and spirits of all God's people. God's spirit still burns like tongues of flame, dancing over the heads of those willing to do God's work and serve God alone. God's spirit still flows like currents of living waters, connecting the hearts and souls of all living, breathing things. God is good. Praise God. All the time, praise God. Good morning and welcome. Um, our first song today is oh, on Pentecost They Gathered, which is number 334 in your hymn. remain standing and join me in the call to worship. I'm sorry, join me in the prayer of invocation. O Holy Spirit, come and blow through this gathering space as mighty wind as you did with the apostles at the beginning of the church. Pour your spirit upon us all to speak your words, see your vision, and to dream your dreams toward your great and glorious day, when everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be filled with that same spirit. Flow like rivers of living water from the hearts of believers through the songs of praise, words of worship, and prayers of devotion. Amen.
bells of praise. Thank you, Bells. What a wonderful gift. Well, we're having a celebration today, and I've brought some items here to help us with that. We've got some balloons. We have a candle, a rather large candle, and some gifts. Can you imagine what kind of party or celebration we're having today. Well, it's a birthday celebration. And it could be, it's not for someone whose birthday is today or near today. What we are, we're celebrating the birth of the church today. When the church really got its first start. And we call that day the day of Pentecost, when God sent the Holy Spirit to be with his people just as Jesus had promised he would. And these birthday items are going to help us uh, remember what happened in church on that very first Pentecost. And it will also remind us of how the Holy Spirit is still at work in the church today. Now balloons, balloons can add a lot to any celebration. But these are flat and lifeless. They need 
someone to breathe some life into them. Yeah, there ain't <laughs> Let's see if I can do this. Wow. Well, in the book of Acts, in chapter 2, the Bible tells us that on that very first Pentecost, the followers of Jesus were all gathered together in one place. And they heard a sound from heaven like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the whole house. And it sounded like this. Close. <laughs> And today we're waiting for the Holy Spirit to fill this place and to breathe new life into the church of Jesus Christ. Now candles, candles usually sit atop a birthday cake and are lit. Watch this. <laughs> and the flame of the candle reminds us that on the day of Pentecost, that tongues of fire came and rested on the people who were gathered in that place. And it filled them with the Holy Spirit. And it gave them the ability to speak in languages other than their own and share God's love with one another. And just like on that day of Pentecost, we need the Holy Spirit to come light our fire so that we can do things that will give glory and honor to God. And what would a birthday celebration be without gifts and presents? And on that very first Pentecost day, the Holy Spirit gave the church gifts of forgiveness, truth, and new life. And the Holy Spirit offers those same gifts to us today. He leads us in truth. He forgives us. And he offers us a better way to live. Now, as we celebrate the birthday of the church today, Let's remember that the Holy Spirit is still alive and, and at work in us today, just like he was in the people of that early church. Would you bow your heads as I say a prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending us the Holy Spirit. Help us to remember that the Holy Spirit still fills the church with power today, just as he did on that very first day of Pentecost. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Our scripture this morning is in the book of Acts. It's chapter 2. Verses 1 through 21, and is on page 1692 in your pew Bible if you want to follow along. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from the heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now, there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one of them heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, Are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, Emolites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? 
Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This ends the gospel reading for this morning. Thanks, Kevin. And thanks for doing double duty today. There are two people doing double duty today. Linda Kranz also covering for Krishna today. Uh, and so you all certainly need to acknowledge uh, the blessings that we, uh, that we have here at St. Paul's Church with people who can step up when needed uh, and even do double duty. So we give you thanks. Grace and peace be to you all from God, our Creator, and from our Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray this day that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts will be acceptable to our God, who is our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. And every once in a while, I preface a sermon by saying, this might possibly be the most important message for you to hear. Now, I could say that a lot, couldn't I? But in this case, I think it's true. So as we approach this Pentecost season, and today being the Sunday of Pentecost, perhaps ears uh, and minds are open to hearing something new, uh, something relevant, something that, yes, I believe is very important for us to hear. Now, there's something I've been saying for years on the topic of road rage, that the way people behave behind the wheel of a car is actually a direct reflection of the state of our world. I think we need to create a new traffic law and enforce it. Driving while angry. Now, you think about it. Road rage is a real thing. Uh, and uh, driving angry is a real thing. And I always wonder, do people just get in their car already angry? Or is it something about driving and having to deal with other motorists that makes us angry? I don't know. It's maybe a little both, perhaps. But it, it really is kind of a barometer of, of how things are right now. And I think there's a heightened um, level of road rage and people just driving angry. The sad reality is how the awful actions and rude behavior. And a few years ago, I was driving to church on Easter morning. I was feeling it, you know, I was ready to lead worship uh, at the church that I was serving at the time. And there was a commercial vehicle right in front of me uh, who was driving way too slow. <clears throat> so I decided to pass him. And as I was passing him, he gave me the middle finger. Okay, happy Easter to you too. But that's, that's what I'm talking about here. So, so you know, I really have this, this theory that uh, the awful actions and rude behavior that have become commonplace in our culture, especially behind the wheel of a car, are strong indicators of the decaying moral, moral fiber of our society. Can I get an amen? <clears throat> Whatever happened to common sense and common courtesy? Or basic manners? Gone. So this is why preachers like William Barber, in a sermon that I heard him preach once, insist that, in his words, we need a moral Pentecost. We need a moral Pentecost. And Barber explains that Pentecost 
is about a new thing. Not simply the next chapter in an ever-evolving story, but a radical new thing. An interruption of the way things are that brings about a transformation for everyone involved. This is why I kind of thought this was a pretty important message for us today. He uses the word interruption of the way things are that will bring transformation for everyone involved. Thomas Kuhn called it a paradigm shift. You've probably heard that phrase before, right? A paradigm shift. But whatever you call it, there are times when a deep moral crisis demands that the way we have framed things up until now is insufficient. Those are his words. The way we have framed things up until now is insufficient, no longer relevant. And so our annual Pentecost Sunday reading of Acts 2, which is, of course, the Acts of the Apostles, describes a most dramatic moment in the life of those most dedicated disciples and the community in which they were gathered. First, there was this amazing linguistic experience of speaking in one language, yet being understood by people of many different languages and cultures. All the people were one in hearing and understanding of the deeper meaning of what they had heard being communicated. And despite their differences, they could all hear what the disciples were saying, each in their own language. What an impressive sight. Fire, wind, and humble Galileans speaking persuasively in many tongues. Suffice it to say, We have come to interpret these as dramatic signs of God doing a new thing. Indeed, dramatic signs of God doing a new thing. And the new thing that God was doing would transform the lives of all those who were present and beyond for future generations to come. To put it in simple terms, the first Pentecost resulted in a movement. A movement that paved the way to a new way of acting and thinking and being. Or as I just said, a paradigm shift, which is a new way of acting, thinking, and being. And so by putting it in those terms, we recognize today the countless ways that church and society have continued to change. There's an ebb and flow there, yes. And sometimes some of the changes haven't always been good as you look at the history of the church. But the church is still evolving. Now, this snippet alone should give us pause and might even challenge us when it comes to our differences today and our attempts as human beings to understand each other, especially on the various issues, what I refer to as the major league issues that we are constantly struggling with. And heck, this reality alone could actually lead us to yet another new morality of understanding. So, name your issue. The abortion battle, gun violence, racial tension, discrimination in all of its forms, immigration, prison reform, political campaigns of negative dirt-slinging types. Okay? And the various wars that are being fought. And, of course, then there's the reactions to the wars that are being thought, being fought. Extremists on both sides of every issue showing up with various and assorted extreme displays of distrust, 
rage, and even violence. And all the negative rhetoric that goes with it. Now please make a special note here. I'm not passing judgment. I'm not passing judgment on anyone. Or neither am I supporting one particular viewpoint here. I make this very clear. I am not supporting one particular viewpoint here. That's called dis diplomacy and tact. And I do my best to practice that. Diplomacy and tact. Important. The truth is, so much of the civil unrest today is the result of grossly immoral actions of certain groups and people exercising poor taste when it comes to the way some people are sharing opinions and advocating for their particular view, often given a bad name to those whom they represent. And this is all yet another indicator of how bad things have gotten. We truly need a moral Pentecost. One of my favorite Bible scholars, Marcus Borg, had a chance to hear him live one day, one time years ago. Bible scholar Marcus Borg reminds us biblically that the spirit of the Pentecost story was about undoing what happened in the Tower of Babel story that occurred in Genesis 11. And it literally, the Pentecost story literally brought back together the broken and divided community of humankind. An important story for us to reflect on. The undoing of something that happened long before that separated and divided peoples. And now the Pentecost is bringing all of them back together In his description of the Pentecost story, the one that upended the Tower of Babel story, Borg reminds us that the different ways we communicate with, uh, with one another can have the power to divide people from one another. In other words, how on that first Pentecost, the Spirit of God rushed in to empower many different kinds of people to do something astounding to communicate effectively with one another. What a concept, right? Different kinds of people with different opinions learning how to communicate effectively with one another. To put it another way, Pentecosts, plural, are, as though, are those things or types of events that ultimately move people to change. And you know, this really should help us better understand why there's so much activism in our world today. Why there are so many public protests happening on our streets, in our streets. And I'm not referring now to those particular protests that are crossing the lines and causing, creating havoc and causing violence and injuries. That's not an acceptable type of protest. I'm talking about the movements that are actually following the rules. Certain peaceful protests that are literally causing some of the much needed disturbances. Much needed disturbances. But done within the boundaries of protests and demonstrations and movements. Because the truth is, activism at its best is simply about advocating for a certain kind of morality makeover. Working for the common good working for the betterment of our society, in short, trying to help make the world a better place. At the end of the day, 
the moral majority want change. But we can't force it. We can't simply force the winds of the Spirit to blow, can we? We do, however, need to be open. Open-minded, open hearts. We need to be open to those new movements. Those movements that are about transforming minds and spirits as we live out the gospel call in the 21st century. The same call that advocates for justice and equity. You know, like it says in our pledge with liberty and justice for all. Which include those people who have fallen prey to the haters and the self-proclaimed morality judges. The ones who boast of knowing the absolutes and who emphasize non-negotiables. You know, my way or the highway those judges who believe that their truth is the ultimate truth and nothing but the truth, that theirs is the one and only truth, the one truth that can and must be used to evaluate all human behavior. Can't do that. So newsflash. Last time I checked, that's called passing judgment. And you know what? That's something reserved for God and for God alone. Passing judgment on another person could be, in my humble opinion, one of the greatest failures ever to befall humankind. So to those self-righteous persons out there, we say, do not judge and you won't be judged. Don't condemn and you won't be condemned. Phyllis Tickle, I love her name, is an author, theologian, and in her book, The Great Emergence, the title alone suggests a Pentecost. In her book, The Great Emergence, Phyllis Tickle talks about this periodic historical institutional rummage sale. It's a phenomenon that the universal church experiences about every 500 years. Now, I'm not going to go into the specifics of it, but you could probably look it up if you want, and that since the beginning of Christ Christianity, about every 500 years there's been a major interruption or change or makeover of the church, the most recent one being the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century. A tickle looks at the church conglomerate today and suggests that we are, quite possibly, right in the middle of one of those inspired cosmic rummage sales where the church asks itself, so what needs to stay and what needs to go? And I'm not talking about uh, what we're going to be doing, having our little rummage sale where everybody puts their stuff in the back of their trunk and we sell it. No, that's not what I'm talking about. This is metaphorical here, okay? A house cleaning, if you will. What needs to stay and what needs to go? And this New Age Pentecost-like event calls for a sincere refocusing of our hearts and minds and invites us to reflect on what the good news actually means in our own day and in our own time. But all the while, still honoring the contributions of those who came before us. That's the beauty of it, is we're not just throwing everything out. We're discerning what needs to stay and what needs to go. And so Tickle and others see this movement as a time of great renewal for the church and churches, as an opportunity for a re-examination of some of the fundamental questions of our reason for even being, but then followed with a renewed commitment and a revitalized sense of our being the church. Now, as I'm saying this, I hope you already recognize the relevance here for St. Paul's United Church of Christ. Sounds like something that a certain local church in transition might do well to consider, hint, hint. And so I ask you, St. Paul's United Church of Christ, is this perhaps a good time for our sons and daughters to prophesy, as it says in the scripture? And I might say, 
Is it perhaps a good time for our grandsons and granddaughters to prophesy to us? I know. Well, let's just say, by a show of hands, how many of you here are concerned that there are not young people coming to church? Okay, my next question is, how many of you have actually talked to a young person about church? Okay. Well, we need to do more of that, don't we? Because the question is, if we've talked to a young person, we would ask them what they would like to see the church doing or doing away with. That's the rummage sale part. So again... I reframe the question or repeat the question. So, St. Paul's United Church of Christ, is this perhaps a good time for our young to dream dreams and our old to see visions? You know, age, as most of you want to think, it's just a state of mind, right? So how's our state of mind if we're in that old category. I'm not judging here. But, you know, doesn't matter what age you are, you can have a vision. And that vision will hopefully be sensitive to what young people want and need and hope for the church today. So part of that is then young to dream dreams and are old to see visions and for an outpouring of, of spirit that calls from tomorrow. And the Jim Manley hymn that we're going to sing in a few minutes covers this very well. An outpouring experience that calls from tomorrow, not last year or last decade or last century, but that calls from tomorrow. We say that uh, we call it in the church, and this was a capital campaign a few years ago with a conference, Forward in Faith. Forward in Faith. So all of this, my friends, is asking, simply asking us to reevaluate our pre preconceived notions and our neat perceptions of what we want church to be. And these are questions that I trust you will not take lightly as you all forge ahead in the search for a settled pastor. And so this is an opportunity for a commercial. So perhaps you will all make a point of joining us for our next Let's Talk Church event, which hasn't been scheduled as of yet, but we're hoping for perhaps sometime midsummer. And so if you're serious, then show up so that we can deal with many of these crucial questions about our identity. And the church is counting on every one of you to show up and to show that you care. That's about all I have to say. A couple weeks ago, I talked about the physical body language of leaning in. Some, some of you know, and some of you will be coming to see the production of Bill W. and Dr. Bob, which is a play that I'm in right now, and I'm playing the part of Dr. Bob, of course, those two characters were the co-founders of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I find myself in many of the scenes when when Bill and I are talking through this whole idea of creating this new program, this new treatment for alcoholism, and I find myself sitting in my chair and leaning in to what he has to say and, of course, to be able to share my thoughts. And I think that's a nice prayer posture. I'm not necessarily asking you to physically assume that position, but it's kind of an image of, I like of kind of really leaning, because when you're leaning into something, you're really present or at least you look like you are. And so if we're kind of having this conversation, you know, picturing Jesus sitting in the other chair, we're kind of leaning in and that, that prayer posture. So I invite you to assume that metaphorically, at least in your mind, that, that posture of, 
leaning in as we move into our time of prayer. This morning, we would ask if the Spirit is moving anyone here among us this day to raise up a concern or even share something that's a joy, a celebration. Anyone want to contribute something this morning? We have a microphone. I would like prayers for my sister Cindy and her family. My brother in law Jim passed on Wednesday after fighting for f four years with cancer. And let's just respond to that, reminding you that when we share a concern, we say, Lord, hear our prayers. So for this concern, Lord, hear our prayers. And others? Certainly want to give thanks for the life that we celebrated yesterday, our little capsule. Continue prayers for her family, but certainly uh, prayer of thanksgiving for 
fact that she's ended her journey on earth and is now residing in the heavenly garden, as I referred to it yesterday. Any others? We pray for the dying ones, knowing that some of us are dying. And we pray for the newly born one, knowing that some of us are arriving. All our hearts and minds are leaning in with clear intention. Hear our prayers, O God, incline your ear to us and grant us your peace as we pray together now. The prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. Time is the kingdom and power and the glory of the earth. Once again, we greet you in the spirit of loving kindness. We are thankful for the many newsworthy happenings as we celebrate the community of Christ that we are here at St. Paul's United Church of Christ. My name is Kevin, and I want to thank you for joining us today, either in person or online. If you haven't already done so, please sign the attendance book located in your pews and pass it along to the other folks in your pew. We could not sustain our ministry without the generous support of our members and friends. If you do not choose to drop off your offering in the uh, offering plate this morning during the musical offertory, you can always find the donation link on our website, or you can always mail in your gift. This concludes our announcements for this morning. Would you join me in the call to offering? Just as everything given to Jesus comes from God, everything given to us comes from Jesus, the foremost human example for our faith. May we respond to that gift with joy mindful of the ways God works in this church, in the community, and in this world. Moved by the Holy Spirit, we are inspired to return thanks through our gifts.
Please remain standing and join me in the prayer of dedication. Faithful God, we thank you for every gift. We delight in returning a portion of what we have been given back to Christ's church. Your generous love and care for all creation knows no bounds. Like Christ who offered himself, let these offerings symbolize the fulfillment of your love by bringing a healing balm of hope, peace, and justice to everyone, everywhere. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn today is number 326, Spirit of Gentleness.
from placidness. Hmm. Isn't that beautiful? May the peace of God abide in you and the love of Christ fill your hearts. And may the power and the wind and the fire of the Holy Spirit move you this day and always. Go in peace. Amen. Thank you.